thought I would start by just asking Margaret to talk in a, in a broad sort of summary way, introduction to the project, the African Devo project. It was easier to talk about it when it was not as big as it is now. <laughs> um, the, the paintings are now about to be 41. Uh, paintings and I began with an album, one album which was a gift to me from my son of Donna Summer's Four Seasons of Love. And on the back of the album she is what I call parodying Marilyn Monroe's Seven Year Itch. And so you have this black uh, disco diva dressed as the Snow Queen. In that image, she is so painted with makeup that she almost looks like a kabuki. She has very, very, very bright, very large red lips. And I saw a mask. And for a long time, I just saw a mask. I didn't even think an African mask. I've been collecting African art since the early 1980s. And um, I actually now, I teach African art, but I've never taken a class in African art. Learning about something that, is, that excites you and interests you and not having the barriers of having a professor that tells you what you're supposed to feel about it. And as I learned about African art, realizing how much of those iconic objects, the mass, really had nothing to do with, with me, with women with black women. I just read as much as I could. And I had a mask that I bought at a yard sale in Princeton for 20 bucks. Beautiful thing, just absolutely beautiful thing. Didn't know much about it and found out things about it. And one day I looked up and saw the album and the mask next to each other in my study. And that is how it began. This idea of bringing something that I thought an object I thought was a beautiful thing and giving it to what I thought was a really beautiful performer and bringing something that becomes inert. I mean, we go to the museums and we look at these objects in those plastic cases, climate control, perfect lighting, and they're dead. They don't move anymore. They don't sing anymore. They don't perform for us. I gave a performer a mask that needed to be performed and put two beautiful things together. And then I saw a project. And that was really satisfying. Then I started going back to albums because I had sold the tonnage. Remember how heavy those things mm. were? Many of the albums that I remember with images, full body images of black women soloists because I love a good ballad. So, you know, Anita Baker, all of them, Tina Turner, they were gone. And then looking through the books that had taught me about African art for masks to complement them. And very often the complement had something to do with the meaning between what that particular soloist sang, what kind of music she sang, and what the mask represents within the group that it was made for. So the, the Tracy Chapman is wearing a mask that, is, that appears when there is sickness, when there is mourning in the community. And her, her songs are so melancholy um, that the two of them just went together immediately. Others I struggled a little bit with. Um, Minnie Ripperton, her mask matches her toenail polish. <laughs> <laughs> One, every painting has its own story to tell. Um, I don't care for backgrounds. So when I choose an album, I lift the image off the background. So if they're carrying anything or if they're, you know, there's stuff going on, it's gone. All I'm interested in is in the performer's body and how it relates to the mask that I want to use. If you look on the background, you'll see there's graffiti. That's my handwriting. I work with cold wax, with oil and cold wax on the background to give it some depth. And then I write the um, titles. For these, for the first half, the titles to the songs are in the background. I didn't want to leave it blank because I didn't want them to be floating in some kind of nebulous space. And I wanted them to sing. 
I wanted them to speak, but I wanted to, to be alive. And words bring surfaces to life. So their most um, well-known songs are written in the, in the background, and that kind of holds them together. That keeps their identity intact. You've chosen these black women performers at, who have these incredible identities of their own, mm -hmm. and I think very iconic uh, identities, and you've given them these vehicles of power, the African masks being uh, masks that are, or objects that are handled and worn by men in, mm -hmm. in Africa and their culture, um, sort of to augment their already very highly developed selves. So, Tell us more about the role, the role of the mask. Does it protect as well as defend? What is the role in the identity, and, um, and how does that work with your individuals? For the most part, these women that I have worked with so far are products. We don't really know who these people are. We don't know these women, but we own them. It's you know, Aretha, not Ms. Franklin. You know, it's Anita. We consume them. We consume them. Um, as listen, interested in music or interested in style, we consume them, but we don't know who they are. The mask is not so much protection as it is empowerment. And it's, it is connecting these women to a legacy of something's good, something's not so good. And that legacy is there in African mass. There are many African mass that appeared and were made for rituals because there was trouble. Every single time they perform, they put themselves at risk of rejection. Right. Every single time. That's and they, the ones that rise to the top, you know, have gone beyond that. Those are the divas. Those are the divas. They, they can get up on that stage every time because they believe that what they have is quality, what they have is valuable, and that they will triumph over their audience. It's interesting. We were talking earlier about the tremendous power of the female figure, not just today, but throughout art history, whether it's being seen through the eyes of a Western male canon of ideal beauty or not, mm -hmm. um, it has tremendous power. Not much authority, but tremendous power through art history. And I find it both powerful and also vulnerable. And I think that's one of the things that makes female beauty so potent, right? And your women are both powerful mm -hmm. and vul vulnerable and very sexualized. Many of those, m many of those images like Tina's and mm -hmm. Grace and their they're, um, they're sexualized, and then you were also talking earlier about them being sort of normalized so that they're less threatening, but they're alluring. Alluring. Uh, out yeah, there, well, I gotta tell you, sex sells. Yeah. <laughs> right? And nudity sells. Right. Um, I only have one nude figure in the entire uh, project so far. Not necessarily because I don't want to paint the nude, but because our sisters don't appear nude on their album covers not willy-nilly anyway. Even though there's some more risque, uh, <laughs> there's a couple of them out there that definitely deserve to be painted, <laughs> but which one of their many audacious images, I don't know. Um, the female body creates pause in the history of art. So it's not surprising to me that I would get some comments about perpetuating these ideas about mm -hmm. black women as being hypersexual and very available and extremely exotic because I am working with images that have already done that to right, them. Right, I mean, right. my, my work is like second hand in terms of the body. Right. I try to be as, as true to the original image as possible, but you know, with, you're painting it, you're blowing it up, it's lies. I lie. I, <laughs> I fix things. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I change colors, stuff like that. What I have done with the mask is to make it more serious. 
So even though there's this sort of excitement around, oh my God, what's going on here, you know? And I do get the, but you covered her beautiful face with this ugly mask. People are going, well, why? You know, she's a good looking person. <laughs> you know? Why, why'd you do that? Yeah, well, even I said uh, earlier to Margaret, you know, we all have our own sense of self. And for me to have my face covered, if I was being depicted, I would find that really like, you know, I'd want to look out from behind it. Um, you know, it's interesting it you should say that. I haven't, there's an exhibition that's getting ready to close now um, on Sunday. At, um, on Jamaica Avenue, right off Jamaica Avenue, called Jamaica Exchange. This wonderful group of women do these pop-ups. No Longer Empty is the name of their organization. And they gave me a corner of what was once a, a retail shop to, cre to create a space for the African divas to become live. So there's a stage, and there's eight masks with hoops on the back that you drop a microphone in and sing along with one of the divas. Art karaoke. Because they couldn't see the audience through the mask, most of the masks had very little slits, they became brave. Yeah. They felt somehow yeah, sure. transformed, and whoever was watching disappeared. So the mask has this transformative yeah. thing about it. You're off the ground, so you become on a pedestal, and they took off. I mean, the opening day, five hours <laughs> of diva-ing. That's <laughs> great. They both came in off the street for an opportunity to become a diva. So the masks, and they had no idea what these masks were about. You know, and forever the teacher, I, I put in white nail polish on the inside of every mask what group it represented, <laughs> so that when they held it in front of their face, they couldn't miss it. So they knew which diva they were. All the divas are named for the mask and then the woman. So Tina Turner is wearing a yakka mask and she's Yaka Tina. You, you don't just come away with just a painting. You come away with an experience. So tell me, one of my questions for you was to summarize the message you'd like us to take away from this great body of work that we're not sure it's over yet. Well. No, it's not over. There's a lot of really amazing black talent out there. I would like for people to look at these paintings and, and, and recognize black talent, not, not just mine. And also to respect the African talent that goes unnamed. We don't have any names for the carvers of these masks that I represent. And they are powerful sculptures. There are things of, of, of value, things that are of purpose. So if you look at my paintings, that's what I would hope, that people would come away with, with a, a recognition for the, the beauty, the talent, the gifts that black people have made to us. But they're really hellified performers. I mean, these women can put on a show. And you know, that's what we love them for. And you know, before I'm done, I need to, to do my uh, due diligence for this generation of black female performers. You know, it's Anita, it's Beyonce. We don't, we don't call these women by their formal names because we consume them.